Uh, let's, let's pray and um, we'll get into the Word. Father, we're so grateful, God, for the work that you're doing in our lives, for the work that you're doing in this church, for the work you're doing in East Haddam, for the work you're doing in Connecticut. We praise you, God, that we are placed strategically by you here. Father, we have purpose. God, we ask that that purpose today be known to us by the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, we give you full access to our hearts, our minds. Transform us. Do with us what you will, God. We want to be lumps of clay, Lord, in your hand. We praise you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So... This doesn't happen often, but every now and again it does. And um, I have my sermon already. I was going to preach on the prodigal son, and I feel like the Lord's telling me to preach on Genesis. So I'm going to preach from Genesis. I'm not going to to preach my sermon. (laughs) And I have have the sermon already because I preach on it every now and again, but I'm not going to use my notes. So um, go to Genesis chapter 3. And the Lord kind of put upon my heart, he said, speak about the image of God. Speak about my image. And in Genesis, what I call it, if you want to title the sermon, it's called Creation Interrupted. So creation was actually interrupted. The good creation that God had created in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 did not come to fulfillment. If you look at Genesis 1, I'm going to give you a little summary. And by the way, when you called me Pastor Paul... You can call me Pastor Paul or Paul, but there's only one person I require to call me Pastor Paul, and that's my sister. (laughs) Like, she'll say, Paul, dinner's ready. I'm like, "Uh -uh." Pastor Paul, dinner's ready. Thank you. (laughs) It was a a joke. So, the the day I got ordained, I went home, and that's the first thing I said to her. I was like, Nicole, from now on... You remember what happened to Joseph, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh wait, no, you were saying about me. <laughs> oh, never mind, I don't like that. They threw him in the well, right. They're like, hey, hey, come on over here. Oh, you're chosen, huh? Exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I thought you were saying, uh, right, of course it was against me. Welcome to Christ's community. <laughs> exactly, exactly, thank you. So, um, but yeah, so, the, the beauty of Genesis 1 and 2 is this, is that um, there's this God, this God who created all things, right, out of his spoken word. So God creates, and boom, immediately creation comes into existence, right? He creates light. He creates um, the heavens and the earth. He creates everything, gives form, gives shape, creates the animals, creates all of these seed-bearing things. The beauty of it is that this God was known, really it would be like looking at it as, a, as the creator God. And then if you see in Genesis 2, this is Genesis 1, in Genesis 2, all of a sudden we get introduced to this Lord God, the Lord God. It's actually a different term, which is the covenant God. So it's funny because in our world today, a lot of people use the term God. But we have to understand that they may not be speaking about our God. And, you you know, it's hard to to think that. You don't want to necessarily come at people and go, well, you know, your God's not my God. That never works. That just doesn't work. It's not loving, it's not kind, and it's not drawing a person and winning a person to Christ. But in all actuality is that this creator God who created all things wanted to be known. He wanted to have relationship. And if you see in Genesis 2, this creator God becomes the God who comes down and shapes and forms man out of the dust of the earth and breathes life into that man. And I find that to be beautiful because in our society so many times we have separated God from Jesus. Jesus is the covenant God. So you cannot have relationship with God outside of Christ. So in this story, if we look at it like that, it was the God with hands who came down, 
shaped us, formed us, breathed life into us, right? I was talking with you that last time about the cells, right? And it's funny, I had, I teach health at my, my kid's school to um, the middle school, and we were doing uh, a, a lesson on cells. And I was like, man, it'd be great to, t-. and I thought this the week before I came here, I said, man, it'd be great to talk to somebody about um, cellular biology. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then I, I was like, <laughs> so I said, what do you do? He's like, I'm a cellular biologist. <laughs> I go, are you really? He goes, yeah. I go, like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, God just, you know, how does that happen? Right? So I'm asking them all about, about the cell, you know, about the DNA in our cells, the blueprint of our life, right? So, and my question to him, which is, I'll, I'll say to you, my question was is, wow, maybe God, maybe the Holy Spirit replicates cells in our body to transform us into the image of Jesus. And Kevin, you said that could be true, right? Like, yeah, like, that, that could, I mean, right? Because don't cells replicate? They reproduce, right? Form new cells, what if we're forming new cells into the image of Jesus? I mean, we know we, we talk about diseases and how our cells attack us. Well, what if our cells are, are where well, they were the purpose of them? What is the purpose of our life? That's why I feel like God wanted me to talk about his image today. The image of God. When, when God created us, he, he wanted to replicate not just people in the earth, right? He didn't want, because um, the animals re- reproduced themselves, did they not? Right? Fish reproduce themselves, right? All creatures, they reproduce themselves. Even humanity, we reproduce ourselves. Just to reproduce? Is that the purpose? Well, of course not. It was to reproduce the image of God and spread it through all creation so that all creation will be filled with His glory. And that was always God's purpose. So as human beings are starting to come together, right? We see um, Adam is created and then God says, uh, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will create a help mate. The word in Hebrew is actually azur, which is um, the same word God uses for himself in relationship to Israel. The same word for woman was the same word that God uses for himself in relationship to his people. Actually, the word is a protector. So, to the ladies out there. <laughs> and I found that women actually, in some senses, are way more protective than men are. You know? Like, you ever see the... I mean, I, in some good senses and some bad senses, you know, the guy, like, throws the kid down the slide, like, go, go, do it, you know? And the lady's kind of like, well, I don't want my kid to get hurt. You know, there's, there's, good, there's good in that, <laughs> you know? There's a protecting, protective instinct, you know, nurturing instinct in, in women. But the way that God was designing us was so unique and special to uh, his purposes for our life. So when God creates Adam, he creates Eve, takes, we, we know the story, he takes the rib, he creates Eve out of Adam. And I see it as such a beautiful moment because... Now, all the creation was passed before Adam, and Adam gave names to creation, but he found nothing comparable to himself until Eve was created. You know, and I always picture in my mind, I I feel like, I picture in my mind that God creates Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathes life into him, and Adam, you know, is is kind of existing in the garden. First of all, Adam was not lonely. (laughs) There's a difference between, it was not good that man is alone, and I've heard people preach on it, and I'm like, eh, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say Adam was lonely. He wasn't lonely. He had God. <laughs> and that, so that is also enough for single people. <laughs> you know, like, I just need to get a mate. And if I get a mate, then my life is going to be complete. You know, it's almost like that old Jerry Maguire movie. You complete me, tear. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you know, so... um Adam was not lonely. Adam was alone. And, and, and God saw it that having uh, two walk together would be stronger than having one walking alone. That makes sense? But he was not lonely. Um, so as he creates the woman, then they 
now have dominion over the garden and subsequently over the world. And by the way, the word, uh, the garden of Eden is almost saying the delight, the pleasure of my heart. God created us and placed us into the garden of his delight. Out of the delight, I'll say it like this, out of the delight of God's heart, he created you. Out of his sheer exuberant joy, he created you. Out of God's absolute immense love, he created you. So therefore, the image in which we bear is joy, love, peace, patience, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and we are God's absolute delight. We talk so much about we live by faith, but it was actually the faithfulness of Christ to which saved us. By grace you have been saved, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. It is a gift that you have received, so that now you are created now in the image of Christ. But here's the thing. We talk, I just said, we talk a lot about us living by faith. But we, it says, we, the saints of God, are his inheritance. So if you have an inheritance, do you take care of it? If you have property, do you care for it? Right? It was funny because the other sermon I was going to preach on was the prodigal son. Prodigal meaning wasteful. And how in that society, when he wasted his inheritance, right, literally like taking a third of that farm that he lived on, the agricultural world that he was in, third of it, and he sold it off, like to a Jew in the, in that century when Jesus was telling the story, a Jew would have been like, boy, that dude's dumb, <laughs> right? Like that was his inheritance. And he didn't want his inheritance, he wanted the money. So he either had to sell it himself or his father sold it, so they literally like auctioned off a third of his farm so that this kid could get his money. And yet the father doesn't argue with them. The father simply gives it to him and says, here, son. Why? Because the father's inheritance, I'll preach on my other sermon, the father's inheritance was the son. It wasn't his land, it was the son. <laughs> so he had all of his investment, the father's investment, the father is God in the story, was all wrapped up in the son, not in the thing, the son himself. So he said, well, sure, I'll, I'll auction off my farm. I'll give you the, your inheritance, you know? It's just money. Because you're my inheritance. Because you're the, the one I love. Because I have a relationship with you. Now the son, in that sense, kind of shaking his fist in the father's face, saying, because now he's causing the father and the older son to have to live with less and have to do more. Because now they had to... Um, you know, if you had abundance, now you have less. Now you might have lack. And the word actually livelihood, it says in the scripture, it says, and the, the father um, divided up his livelihood. Livelihood in that is God's physical gift of life. It was literally like his life. He had to divide up his life because he grew his own food, right? He, he, you know, he had to do all of these things. And if he had less, he had to live with less. So it would cost his servants less. You know, he may have had to cut off some servants and get rid of them. Now, what are they going to do? So a Jew in that, in his mindset would have been thinking like, this guy's crazy. Why would this younger son do that? He cost everybody everything. Not, not counting you know, (laughs) breaking almost all of the Ten Commandments, right? Honoring his father and mother. He didn't honor his father, you know, right? He goes off, he spends all of the, all of his, 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 his wages. He spends everything on prodigal living, wasteful living, partying in another country, which means he's hanging out with Gentiles, (laughs) which was also forbidden, right? At the time, you know, the Gentiles then were like, oh, hey, little Jew boy, 
You know, like I'm saying that not in a derogatory term. I'm just simply probably saying what they were thinking in their mind because they didn't have a very good relationship with Israel. So they're probably saying, hey, why don't you go feed our pigs? Knowing full well, <laughs> I violated the Torah that the, the Jewish people should not have any contact with, with swine. So they make him go feed the swine, like, ha, 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 you know, kind of sticking it to him. So here's the point. When we get to Genesis 3, now the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field. The serpent says, did God really say? When we're faced in our lives with situations that it's not necessarily the will of God for us, we need to ask the question, who am I serving? Because when... when, when the serpent comes to Eve and says, did God really say? She should have said, who's God? When we're faced, because I find that we're being bombarded in our culture, in our society, with so many different things that are vying for our allegiance, right? Like, which party do you belong to? Right? Who do you like this person governing you? Do you not like this person? Um, who do you follow? You know, what do you think about gun control? What do you think about, right? So we're being bombarded in our society, in our culture, with these, with these, this understanding. And there's a lot of even Christians out there who, I'm not saying people can't be involved in politics. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that when it vies for your heart, when it tries to grab a hold of your heart, it's not God. Because Eve should have known in this verse, did God really say? She only knew God as the Lord God. She didn't, it's almost like saying, really what the enemy was saying to Eve, did deity say to you? Who's deity? Who is that? I don't know who that is. I don't, I don't know God outside of Christ. I have no relationship with God without Jesus. So when people talk to me about God and it's not Jesus, it doesn't resonate in my heart because I only know him as this. And when the, the enemy does the same thing to us today, he vies for our allegiance by coming at us from a perspective that is not Christ. He does, the enemy will never uplift Christ. Now, he will have an antichrist, counterfeit Christ, and a lot of what I'm talking about is counterfeit Christ. It's not truly the God who loves us, the God who uh, dies for us, the God who comes right and sacrifices himself on a cross to save us. So in Genesis chapter 3, the enemy says, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the servant, the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day of you eat it, the day you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here's the thing. She was already good. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. She was already good. You're already what God has already declared over you. <laughs> like, we struggle so much with who we are. Do we not sometimes? We just struggle constantly with who we are. The word, Jesus said, I don't come to condemn the world, right? The world is already condemned because of the word I've already spoken. The reality of all of life everywhere has already been declared. It's already been settled because God has already said it. Once God speaks it, it's a reality. We, can, we can't change it. We can't alter it. It simply is. And so the reality of who you are has already been declared. It's already been settled. Well, what do we do then? We simply believe, right, 
that God has spoken the word over our life. Galatians 3 says that. It says, you believe the word, right? That Jesus was crucified, publicly crucified, that you saw him, and therefore your life was transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you became a child of God. I'm summarizing, but, and you became a child of God. You can't alter that fact. It's been declared of who you are. It's settled. So in this, in this, in this lie, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. She said, but God already told me I'm good. Look at Genesis 1 and 2. Creation, it's good. He says it. It's good. It's good. This is good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. She already was good. Because God already said it. So, (laughs) the enemy comes and says, well, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. To know something is not intellectual knowledge. It is not knowing something information. Knowing in scripture is to become it. It's to become one with it. It's to become intimate with it. The word is yada in Hebrew, which it means intimate knowing. It's the same word that we use for sex in the Old Testament, is to become one with. So you already intimately know God. You already have relationship with God. So what was the enemy really saying in this verse then? If he was now the enemy's right, the counterfeit, the subtle subtleness of God of, of, of the enemy, the subtleness like what was he really saying if he wasn't saying, Well, you're gonna be like right, Pastor Vicky? Like you're not gonna be Well, I'm already good, so I already know good. What are you gonna become? Evil. But, but they, but I'm not gonna run, I'm not gonna like come out and say that, right? Hey, listen, you eat this, you're gonna become so wicked that you're gonna do things you could never believe, right? You're gonna kill people, right? You're gonna murder, you're gonna do this, 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 right? No relationship with God. God's gonna be completely out of your life. Well, I'm not gonna lead with that. I mean, right? Was that what the enemy was gonna say? No. So the subtleness comes in, says, Hey, look at this. This looks pretty good, right? And she sees it and she says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. And in later other parts, they've interpreted it of the Bible that Eve was deceived. She was actually deceived. She was tricked. Like she ate unknowingly. But the point is not, we make it so much, sometimes you hear people like, well, the woman ate first and... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, downhill after that, right? Right? That's not the point of the story. The point was, whether you've been deceived or you ate knowingly, you ate. I ate both. (laughs) I ate deceivingly and knowingly. That's the point. We're We're all trapped. And this actually ties into the prodigal son story where Jesus' heart, we make the Pharisees out to be such horrible people and sometimes they are. I mean, they did kill Jesus. <laughs> they wanted him to, you know, they wanted him to, to be killed because of their jealousy. But why is Jesus always talking to Pharisees? He's always with them and he's always talking. They're always coming to him like coming at him, but he's always talking to them. He never cuts them off. He never, a, a few times in the book of John, there's one from like John 8, 9, and 10. Jesus gets really mad at the Pharisees and basically cuts them off. But that's really the only time I see him hammering them, which I, I do love that, those two, three chapters. It's really cool. Jesus is like really mad at them and he's just hammering them. And I love that part. But he's always speaking with them because his heart is for them. His heart is so for them. He's like, guys, Give your heart, like the older son's story was supposed to be the Pharisee standing there in condemnation. But the the father doesn't talk to the younger son about his, doesn't plead with the younger son, please don't leave. He lets the son go. But he actually pleads with the older son. He pleads with him. And he says, son, my heart's been with you. 
right? But we're, the point of the story is whether you're religious or you're irreligious, neither heart was with the father. The father's heart was with both sons, the religious one and the non-religious one. His heart was for both of them. But their heart, their hearts were cold and they weren't with the father. They didn't love the father. What he's saying to the older son is, son, if you loved me, you would love what I love. If our hearts are with the father, with God, then we love what he loves. And so it's no big deal when somebody that we think they have done so bad, so much, they don't deserve it, right? But God loves them. God's heart is for them. And if our heart is with God, we don't even have to like muster up love sometimes. We can't do it sometimes. But if our heart's simply with the Father then our heart will be with him. We just simply trust him, that he knows what he's doing. And when Eve ate, I'm kind of going back and forth between the two stories. When Eve ate, her eyes no longer could see the reality of her father. And because now sin entered creation, creation was interrupted. Because she had not, they had not gotten to the tree of life yet. They had not eaten from this tree of life. The tree of life is simply obedience to the Father. That's what the tree is. That's what trees represent. If we're obedient and faithful to God in walking out everything that he shows us, I went to Framingham State Prison last Sunday. Um, a, a girl, because it's a woman's prison, a girl who used to be in my youth group back when I was at a church in Wilmington, Massachusetts, got an OUI and flipped the car and a pr- passenger was ejected, hurt but not killed, thank God. But she got a year. And so I visited her last week. And um, we actually talked about a lot of this stuff. And seeing, she looked at me after kind of, there were other people there and then when they left, she looked at me and she said, Paul, she said, it's my fault. I did it. And I said, man, I said, you're so much further than so many other people like that fight in tooth and nail for years. I said, simply saying, like, did you do it? Yeah. What would society look like if we just said, was it you? It was. It was. It was. It was me. Guilty as charged. (laughs) You know, like, what would that look like if we just simply said, I kind of did this. The whole point of the story is that we're all trapped. Whether we ate knowingly whether we, de- we were deceived, we somehow got to this place. But by grace, you have been saved. So now, the image of God has returned. And by the way, in Genesis, after God goes through all of these things, he never, please find for me in here, where God curses humanity. God never cursed humanity. He says humanity, because of the results of the sin, brought upon themselves a curse. We bring upon ourselves a curse. God doesn't curse humanity. God brought actually the propitiation for the curse in Jesus Christ, and then the curse was laid upon him to remove the curse from humanity. God always, first thing God does, which is scary, he actually takes animals and he slaughters them and he makes skins. I mean, think about that. The animals that Adam was just naming, 
God is now killing to make a make propitiation, to make a covering for Adam and Eve, to clothe their nakedness. God is always making a way out of no way. Sin, I always say this, sin was really God's deal. God was the one who was going to deal with sin. Our job is to love and live faithfully to him. And what I said to this girl last week in prison was, whatever God shows you, you have to start living the faith that God shows. Like, if God shows you, like, pick up your, your word and just read it. Like, pick up your word and read it. If God shows you, like, puts upon your heart to pray, well, just go and pray. Like, we need to start also living faithfully in what God has shown us to do. That's right. I mean, it's even small steps. Whatever it is, sometimes we don't want to do it. But I found in those moments when we don't want to do it, God knows you don't want to do it. <laughs> and when you do it, there's something great that kind of breaks forth or arises in you. You know? I don't always want to do specific things. And sometimes, I can't lie, I don't. <laughs> Even though the Lord wants me to do it, I still don't do it. And it's what Pastor Vicky said. His mercies are new every morning. And I get up, and I'm like, oh, God. You guys walk outside and just take a breath of fresh air or something when you wake up in the morning? Like, when you, first, when you first hit that air outside, you just go, I do. I don't know. <laughs> Kelly laughs at me because she thinks that everybody else does what I do, but even though some people don't, she thinks that's fun. She's like, not everybody thinks like you. <laughs> Whatever. So... Genesis 4, what we see now, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not Genesis 4, Genesis 5. What we see is one of the saddest, actually, moments in the Bible. It says that Adam and Eve had a son whom they named Seth because we know Cain kills Abel in chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, it says, in Adam's likeness, in his likeness, he had Seth. What did we lose? We lost the image in our life. That's why in Colossians it says that Jesus is the image of God. That he is the express image of God the creator God, of God. So we, we get back the image when we're born again. That image is renewed and over and over and over again in our life. And then when we go into all the areas, all the environments of our life, we then bring forth that image over and over and over again. And people, I don't know if you've ever had people say to you, like, there's something different about you. <laughs> there's, something, there's something unique about you. And what's unique about us is the image of God. Is that a lot of people, they, they, they don't see it. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be this, this big thing. It just simply has to be whatever God has put before you to do. Whoever God has put before you to speak to, right? Whoever God has put in your life as a friend. That when we act faithfully with the Lord, when we do what God has set before us to do, then those connections will naturally happen. The last point I want to share is... I'm going to go back to the prodigal son story. When the prodigal son comes to himself in the far country, he says, I'm sorry. He 
He says, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So basically what he says is, I will humble myself. I made a mess of things, and I made a mess of my life. So he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And does his father wait for him to come up the road? No. His father jumps off that patio and runs as fast as he can to his son. Throws his arms around him. Starts kissing him on his neck. For though we are Adam and Eve, (laughs) we are now in the family of God because God first loved us. And that's what that says. God first came to us to rescue us. God first saw us from a long way off and ran down the road to rescue us. God first did anything that you have in your life was a gift of God. It was grace. And grace is, I have made a mess of my life, but God has made a way out. But God will continually make a way in your life to rescue you, to bring hope, to bring life, to create in you newness of spirit, freshness, whatever it might be in your life. Like, we live in the place of constant humility. We live in the place where we say, God, when when, when I was first broken and I first came to you, God, what was it like? Those are the places that he wants us to continually live. Because there is a tendency, there is a tendency that we're forgiven, we're healed, we're restored, we're set right, and we somehow become like an older child, older son, like the older son in this. You know? Like, I'm doing okay now, right? But then when somebody that we don't like, or we think, oh, look at that person. Ugh. You know, we do it all the time. I've done it, right? Like this person somehow is unworthy of God's love. God doesn't see things like that. Paul says that all were trapped in under sin. That was what the law was supposed to do. And I can't lie. Like, have you ever tried to implement, you know, being a coach and all that type of stuff? You you try to implement like rules. <laughs> And the more you implement them, the worse behavior gets. (laughs) Like, so you just yell louder. And next thing you know, you're like yelling. And actually, the kids kind of sit back and like, man, you're crazy. (laughs) Like, they kind of look at you like, why are you yelling all the time? You know, you're like, because you're not doing what I want. But then there's other moments. When you win a child's heart, when you win somebody to the Lord, in the sense that that's what Jesus did with us. He won our hearts to himself. He won us. Not because he said, you know, you got to do this, 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 and this. But simply because he loved us. Because I was already lost. We were already trapped. And we couldn't break free from it. And simply crying out to the Lord, he rescued us. Set our feet upon a rock. Now, I'm not saying that then we go back. The scriptures talk very clearly that whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Like, if you go back, you know, it's almost as if the dog returns to his own vomit. That's what it's like when you go back into sin. But there's a distinction between living a holy life and living a self-righteous life. God wants us to live a holy life. And when we are holy, like him, then we we love the things that God loves. It just creates in us just this love, an abundance, an overflow of love in our hearts. And when we're, we're flowing in love, then we, we, we can receive people to ourselves. We can receive people into churches. We can receive people. I actually think that there needs to be kind of a, um, <clears throat> I don't want to say like a new revival, but a, a new witness to the reality that's in us. 
that we need to be able to be able to speak to others about the hope that is in us. Like when I was at this prison last week, she was asking me, she said, so I told a bunch of people that you were going to be here and they had all these questions and I wrote them down. <laughs> so she wrote down a bunch, she had a piece of paper and she wrote down a bunch of questions that she wanted to ask me because the other people, she said, and they don't have anybody visiting them. By the way, you guys want a ministry? Prison ministry. You know. Prison ministry. Long, people are longing for somebody to visit them in prison. Longing for people to visit them. When the father comes to the son and he throws his arms around him, he says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring out that fatted calf and we're going to have a party. We are going to celebrate. Because Jesus said, for there is more joy in the presence of the angels in heaven when one sinner repents than 99 sinner, 99 people, righteous people, he says, who need no repentance. It's tongue-in-cheek. Jesus, typical tongue-in-cheek Jesus. He's saying, right, you righteous people, remember, there are none righteous. There's no, not one. There's none who do good. There's none who sought after God. He says, for all have gone astray and gone after their own way. So what Jesus was saying in front of these Pharisees is, don't you want to be the one? He was saying to them, don't you want to be the one? Don't you want to be the one person where there's joy in the angels of heaven, there's joy everlasting, that, that there's, there's this rejoicing, right? That this person has now come to faith. They've come from, from this place and now they're in this place and, and God has accepted them. Don't you want that to happen? And don't you want it to happen with other people, right? Where there's this celebration that says, oh, <laughs> oh, God, Like, he loves you, right? He's so for you that he sacrificed his son, that he gave up his life, that you might have life abundant, that that God would pour out his blessings upon you. And the promise was the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would flow through your life, flow through everything that you touch, for everybody that you, you come in contact with, that you're in a grocery store, and you lay hands on somebody to pray for them, that you speak the word of truth to them, by the way, Jesus himself is what he, all of humanity needs. Like just Jesus, that's it. Himself. They don't need me. They don't need, in essence, the church. Yet, it's because we love God that we're here. It's because of what Christ has done that we can love each other. It's because of, of the work of Christ in our hearts that we worship him that we come together and we just we sing praises to God. And when that happens, right? It's a, God inhabits the praises of his people. That God flows and the Holy Spirit kind of grips our hearts. And we I I've been in churches where right? You're in worship and God starts speaking like gifts to you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit start to come, right? We've seen that. Start gifts of the Holy Spirit start to manifest in your heart and you start thinking in your mind, like if you have a thought that says, whatever it might be, I want to start speaking to people more about Jesus. That's not um, you. That's the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Because the Holy Spirit exalts Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. If you say, um, you know, how does, in my job, what I'm doing right now, what is God, what's the ministry in it, in my job? What I do, what's, what's the ministry in it, right? That's the Holy Spirit. Or you know what the ministry is and you want more of it. That's the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit exalts Jesus. And when Jesus is exalted, your life will start to flow with whatever it might be. My life, anybody's life. 